All right, guys, now we're going to dive right into the Progressive Era and look at the reforms that happened during this time period. And the biggest reason reform was needed is because you're fighting corruption. Local government was totally controlled by these political machines, which were powerful organizations linked to the political parties. Each party had one, and it was controlled by a boss. And the kinds of things they'd do is they'd accept bribes for overlooking violations. They'd receive kickbacks from contractors, just anything you can possibly imagine. Now, this guy right here, William M. Tweed, a.k.a. Boss Tweed, was probably the most famous. And he ran the New York Democratic political machine based out of Tammany Hall uh, within the heart of the city. And they were notorious for corruption. I mean, Thomas Nass tried to expose this through countless political cartoons like the one that you see right here with their corruption in the voting area. And before 1883, the government jobs were just went to friends of politicians with the spoil system. But after 1883, the government passed the Pendleton Act, which required that you had to pass a test in order to get a government job. Seven years later, they're going to pass the Sherman Antitrust Act, which will regulate um, monopolies, like we talked about with big business and Rockefeller and Carnegie. They also passed the Interstate Commerce Act to try and bring in the railroads and require them to charge reasonable and fair rates. A lot of these new reformers were socialists, and they believed the government should own and operate all businesses. In fact, the American Socialist Party merges during this time period, uh, founded in 1898 by Eugene V. Debs, who actually becomes their main candidate for president on multiple occasions. Uh, he never ends up receiving more than 6% of the vote in any election. They also have muckrakers, who were journalists who would go out to expose problems. Now, this right here is a picture of Eugene V. Debs, who is that founder of the Socialist Party, like I mentioned. But some of these muckrakers were women like Ida Tarbell, who wrote a huge expose of the Standard Oil Corporation that led to its being broken up. You also had guys like Upton Sinclair, who writes probably the most famous one in a book called The Jungle. It was only when the whole ham was spoiled that it came into the department. Cut up by the 2000 Revolution a minute flyers and mixed with a half ton of other meat, no odor that was ever in a ham could make any difference. There was never the least attention paid to what was cut up for sausage. There would come all the way back from Europe old sausage that had been rejected and that was moldy and white. It would be dosed with borax and glycerin and dumped into the hoppers, and made over again for home consumption. There would be meat that had tumbled out on the floor, in the dirt and sawdust, where workers had tramped and spit uncounted billions of consumption germs. There would be meat stored in great piles in rooms, and the water from leaky roofs would drip over it, and thousands of rats would race about on it. It was too dark in these storage places to see well, but a man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep handfuls of the dry dung of rats. These rats were nuisances, and the packers would put poison bread out for them. They would die, and then the rats, bread, and meat would all go into the hoppers together. This is no fairy story and no joke. The meat would be shoveled into the carts, and the man who did the shoveling would not trouble to lift out a rat even when he saw one. There were things that went into the sausage in comparison with which a poisoned rat was a tidbit. There was no place for the men to wash their hands before they ate dinner, and so they made a practice of washing them in the water that was to be ladled into the sausage. There were the butt ends of smoked meat and the scraps of corned beef, and all of the odds and ends of the waste of the plants that would be dumped into old barrels in the cellar and left there. Under the system of rigid economy which the packers enforced, there were some jobs that it paid only to do once in a long time, and among these was the cleaning of the waste barrels. Every spring they did it, and in the barrels there would be dirt and rust and old nails and stale water, and cartload after cartload of it would be taken up and dumped into the hoppers with fresh meat and sent out for the public's breakfast. Some of it they would make into smoked sausage, but smoking took time and was therefore expensive. They would call upon their chemistry department and preserve it with borax and color it with gelatin to make it brown. All of their sausage came out of the same bowl, but when they came to wrap it, they would stamp some of it special, and for this, they would charge two cents more a pound. You saw there. I mean, this just exposed the entire meatpacking industry. Even though he was trying to write about the 
working conditions, people got outraged about the unsanitary conditions, and it leads to the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act. You also saw an expansion of democracy during this time period, uh, much more so than you saw even during the, than even during the Jackson era. You had a primary system that allowed voters to choose the party candidates. Citizens could put issues on the ballots with the initiative. They could vote on an acts passed by the state legislature in the referendum. They could recall state officials through the recall system. And with the 17th Amendment, they could actually elect their senators directly. Thanks, guys, for paying attention. Hopefully we took good notes.